the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you're able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Director of the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Dr. Dave Carter. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see some familiar faces here for our final installment of our 2021 Dole Institute DMH Command and General Staff College program. Uh, today we have an exciting program for you. We're going to have a pretty good discussion on the Cold War and how the, the, the theories of, of the Cold War in the United States developed. Uh, it's going to be presented uh, by, by two of our, our, our historians from, from Fort Leavenworth, Dr. Dave Mills and Dr. Gates Brown. Uh, Dr. Dave, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Dave Mills is a, a graduate of North Dakota State where he got his PhD, and he will give us a, 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 a good background on George Kennan, and he will be followed by Dr. Gates Brown, who took his PhD right here at the University of Kansas, and, uh, and he will follow up with, with a, a, a talk on, on uh, Nietzsche, check. Nietzsche, I, yeah, it's okay. The one, one was German, okay, I got it. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance today, and I, I hope you enjoy this program today. Dr. Mills? All right. So greetings, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. And so George Kennan and Paul Nitza were friends, even though they had been bitter rivals their whole lives. Uh, although each thought the other's views were uh, uh, on national security would lead to utter catastrophe, they were, they were never bitter enemies. They were the only two significant government officials to have input into the Cold War decision making from the beginning of the Cold War through its end. These topics included the Marshall Plan, Korea, the arms race, Vietnam, detente, SALT, the reunification of Germany, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Although equally important and equally influential, but at different times, their views were vastly different. Kennan was the introvert, thinker, realist, and government outsider who came up with the word containment that influenced Cold War policy for two decades after he suggested it. Kennan thought the word containment was a political policy and not a military strategy. He thought it more important to confront the communists politically, culturally, artistically, economically, and socially with military conflict far down on the list of options. He was no pacifist, but argued that if the United States wanted peace, we should act peacefully. Sometimes it was hard to know exactly what he did stand for because it seemed that he was opposed to most policies of the presidential administrations that, in which he, he served. He was a visionary, a big picture thinker, who immediately understood that the, the division of Germany and the creation of NATO would harden the division of Europe and the positions of the United States and the Soviet Union. This was not a popular opinion when Many in the Truman administration had settled on a policy of opposition to the Kremlin, and perhaps even military conflict. When the Cold War was just beginning, he understood how it would end, knowing that the internal contradictions in communist ideology meant that it would eventually collapse under the weight of its own inconsistencies. 
George Kennan worked in the American Embassy in Moscow when it was opened in 1933 and continued through 1937. He returned for the last couple of years of uh, World War II um, and spoke Russian like a native, studied the Soviet economy, and enjoyed reading Russian literature. He was thoroughly familiar with Russian culture, language, customs, and traditions. And although he had no, nothing but contempt for communist ideology and Joseph Stalin himself, during the war he tried to warn the State Department about the duplicity of the Soviet Union, but was largely ignored. Perhaps the most famous topic for which Kennan is known was a long telegram that changed the course of Cold War history. On February 9th, 1946, Joseph Stalin gave a speech at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. In, uh, in his version of events, Stalin blamed the West for World War II, claiming that capitalist nations will always go to war with each other when poorer nations will attack richer ones. Stalin spoke cryptically about nuclear weapons and openly about war with the West. Kennan sent a summary of the speech to the State Department in Washington, but soon the State Department wrote him back asking for a detailed analysis of the speech and Soviet-American relations. For three years, he had sent exactly this information to the State Department, and they did nothing with it, but now they needed that same information and wanted it quickly. Working the communications desk at the American Embassy in Moscow was Martha Motner, a young woman who had just graduated from college and she wanted a career as a diplomat. Well, the only way for a woman to pursue such a job in 1946 was to start at the very bottom of the career ladder as a clerk. So Motner learned how to type after college, uh, joined the State Department who offered her a job at the American Embassy in Moscow. She had a date with a Swedish diplomat and her shift was nearly over at 7 p.m. when Kennan came in and asked her to type in a long message to Washington. Sending this message would take hours and she asked Kennan if the message absolutely positively had to be delivered that night. It did, Kennan said. With a sigh, she abandoned her plans and turned to her task. Kennan's message has been called the long telegram, with accusations that it took about 8,000 words to complete. Actually, it was only about 5,300, but it was still a record length for the, any telegram sent to, by the State Department. Motner took two hours to type in the essay uh, into the telegram system, but it went out that night, February 22nd. A colleague of Kennan's made copies of the, of, the, of the message and distributed it throughout the State Department and then to every American embassy in the world. Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal made copies and, and uh, delivered those throughout the military establishment. The Secretary of Defense read it, the Secretary of State read it, the President read it, and so did a number of Soviet spies because it got left out on, so on desktops throughout Washington, D.C. But the telegram gave Washington insight into why the Americans were unable to establish meaningful relations with the Soviets. The State Department had met Soviet demands congenially on one hand and forcefully on the other hand, but nothing seemed to resonate with the, uh, with, with the Soviets. American officials were simply at a loss as to how to deal with the Soviets in any meaningful way. So Kennan's response was based on a deep understanding of Soviet, uh, of Soviet society and culture. Uh, and it put the blame for the failure of relations squarely on the Soviets. But most importantly, it seemed to provide a path forward. To Kennan, Soviet actions made sense as their psychology and history predetermined their hostility. Russia and Russians, as they saw their country, was a huge nation of peaceful farmers uh, living in a vast and exposed plain that had been invaded by nomadic peoples for centuries. In that current day, the Soviets felt themselves just as vulnerable from a more advanced society 
that surpassed the Soviet Union and their political system in every conceivable way, including technologically, economically, organizationally, and competently. Now, the Soviet officials had the added dilemma of convincing the Russian people that they deserved to be there. The men at the top of the Communist Party did not really believe in communism, Kennan said, but it gave them an air of legitimacy and respectability. Kennan believed that Stalin and his deputies were, in its essence, thugs, at the, head of the, the, at the head of a government that required them to be something else, because the promises of communism never came to pass. So the Soviets had to keep preaching of the inevitability of war with the capitalists, upon whom they could blame all of their problems, including the failure of their promises. In light of Soviet history, tyranny, and the instability of Marxism, the Soviet reactions kind of made sense. No matter what American officials said, they could, never be, they could never overcome the Soviet need to blame them for all of their problems. Kennan argued that nothing short of complete disarmament on the part of the West would even dent Soviet-American relations, and even then, the Soviets would probably smell a trap. The telegram made Kennan famous within the State Department, and he lobbied for a job back in the United States. He took a position as the Deputy Commandant for Foreign Affairs at the National Defense College. Essentially, what he was to do was to think a lot about the, the Soviet and American uh, dilemma. So he quickly began a nationwide speaking tour in the summer of 1946, when he ar argued that Mer America had to find a middle ground in dealing with the Soviets, somewhere between war on one hand and peace on the other hand. The Soviet Union was trying to increase its power, he said, and the United States needed to push back wherever possible. The Soviets didn't want war, but they wanted to steadily accumulate victories and more territory. The more speeches that Kennan gave, the more he refined his message. The United States had to fight back. If it appeared that the communists were about to take power in a vulnerable nation, then America needed to step up and provide aid to nations under threat of communist domination. And we had to publicize our efforts. For example, the Soviets were encouraging an insurgency in Greece. And Kennan argued that America should send three ships to Greece, all painted white with the slogan, uh, Aid to Greece, painted on the side. And the first bags of wheat that we delivered to Athens should be delivered in an army jeep with a Hollywood blonde sitting on the, on the radiator. Well, there's no Hollywood blonde sitting on this float, but it is a celebration of sorts, the one millionth ton of wheat shipped from the United States to Greece. Kennan never argued that the United States should actually overthrow the Soviet government. I mean, a whole lot of people would rally to its defense and, and there's no telling what would rise in its place. He argued that we simply had to stop Soviet expansion. As Kennan put it, the problem of meeting uh, the Kremlin in international affairs boils down to this. Its inherent expansive tendencies must firmly be contained at all times by counterpressure which makes it constantly evident that attempts to break through this containment would be counter to Soviet interests. Forrestal, Secretary Forrestal, had attended many of Kennan's lectures, and he's more impressed with the man after each one. Forrestal asked Kennan, now the historical record's a little, a little fuzzy here, exactly who's talking to Kennan about writing the article, it, it kind of depends on the source you're reading and how deeply you want to uh, chase that rabbit down the, down the hole. But uh, eventually, Secretary of the Navy Forrestal asked Kennan to write an article s summarizing his, uh, his, his presentations that he'd been giving, giving all summer. So Kennan complied. He wrote the paper. Forrestal sent that paper around Washington as well. Uh, and it landed on the desk of the editor of the magazine, Foreign Affairs. So the editor read it, and he asked Kennan to write another article, more specifically designed and, or, or edited to, uh, to fit in the magazine. 
And, and Kennan agreed, but he said, look, I, I'm a second-tier State Department official, and I have no business writing foreign policy. I'll write your article if you agree to use a, a pseudonym or a pen name for my article. And the editor agreed, and so the, ed the uh, article actually agreed, uh, uh, the art article actually uh, emerged as uh, written by X. So this article, actually titled The Sources of Soviet Conduct and published in July of 1947, was widely read, embraced throughout Washington, and argued that a Soviet-style communism had to be contained. However, many have confused what Kennan wrote with what he meant and what he said, which were different at different times in his life. Most obser observers read the word containment as military confrontation, because what he meant wasn't clear. Kennan meant pressure, actually, not violence. Uh, he also argued that the United States should seek to block Soviet advancement in a perimeter defense, in other words, defending everything, but he later changed his mind to a, a strong point defense, or only those areas that were of vital interest to the United States. The problem was that Kennan's solution called for long-term patience, not a virtue of American politicians or any government official for that matter. So they inter the government officials simply interpreted Kennan's message the way that suited their interests. Specifically, Kennan reasoned, look, if countries declare that, that they have, uh, that they're facing a communist attack and they are looking for American resources to, in order to fight this communist insurgency, look, you're going to have a line of ambassadors with their hands out proclaiming that they've found nasty communists hiding behind every bush. Kennan argued that the United States should contain communism only in places vital to its interests and where it had a reasonable chance of success. He had little influence in the matter, however, as Harry Truman suggested that we would defend every nation that was facing a communist insurgency. Truman wrote, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples everywhere in the world who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. And then he asked Congress for $400 million to, su to support the governments of Greece and Turkey. Kennan cringed at, at this announcement, believing that too many nations would come asking for donations in the name of anti-communism, or the United States would pick and choose where we're going to intervene, and pretty soon the word of America uh, would, would leave the rest of the world cynical about our intentions. So Kennan, whether he liked it or not, received the credit and the blame for America's attempts to contain communism, communist aggression throughout the world. Those included forays into Korea and Vietnam specifically that Kennan would vigorously oppose. If Cold War history remembers Kennan as the father of the containment strategy, most never knew of his greatest achievement, which was guiding the Marshall Plan into existence. Germany was still trying to recover economically, socially, and politically between 1945 and 1947. The Allies couldn't, couldn't decide how much industry to allow Germany, but they erred on the side of too little, fearing a rearmed and militant foe. But industry and agriculture went hand in hand. And Germany went hungry for the first two years after the war, as the Allies tried to maintain a diet of just over 1,500 calories per person per day throughout Germany. After the devastating winter of 1946 to 1947, the Allies attempted to guarantee a diet of just over 1,000 calories per day per individual. Germans by the thousands died of disease caused by starvation. Just as importantly, the Allies had to prove to both Europe and the rest of the world that capitalism was better than communism. In the first paper to emerge from Kennan's policy planning staff, a think tank, 
now he now directed in the State Department, Kennan argued that the survival and, and uh, rehabilitation was the most important task in front of the State Department at that time. He described in detail a massive aid program and then passed this plan on to Marshall. Two weeks later, on June 5, 1947, Marshall announced plans to provide loans to all of Europe. Kennan had provided most of the ideas for the policy and for the speech. The Europeans themselves would determine their goals, not the Americans, and Kennan believed that they would guard their values and their progress more diligently than if those objectives were dictated to them. More specifically, Kennan argued that Germany should play a part in the, in the plan, which was controversial, as many still viewed Germany as a defeated nation that should suffer indefinitely. However, as the conquerors, it was America's responsibility to keep Germany fed, and it was costing American and British taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars a year with no end in sight. But Kennan understood, and others were beginning to accept, that German recovery was pivotal for them to be self-sufficient and for the recovery of Western, or for the rest of Europe. As Kennan argued, to support recovery in Europe and oppose recovery in Germany is nonsense. You can have one, or you can have both, or you can have neither. Simply, the announcement of the Marshall Plan had an immediate effect on Europe and their greatest shortcoming, which was confidence. The Marshall Plan's greatest contribution was the American insistence, insistence that they would not abandon the Europeans. Kennan was a wise Cold War theorist. He became, became the ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1951, but was declared persona non grata the, final, the, the, the year afterwards when he compared Stalin to Hitler. He worked in the Eisenhower administration. He became the ambassador to, to Yugoslavia under President Kennedy. Uh, he worked in government on and off for most of his adult life, but in the overall scheme of things, he lost influence after the late 1940s. Rising in his place was Paul Nitze, who Dr. Gates Brown will discuss in detail. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. When we look at Paul Nitze, he doesn't write a long telegram. It's about 5,000 words, roughly 20 pages. The document that he's going to be responsible for is 66 pages. So if length is a barometer of success, I don't know if that's a good measure or not, but Nitza outdoes Kennan. What we're going to talk about is a little bit about who Nitza was, discuss the context of what's going on in the late 1940s, and talk about the specifics of NSC 68, which is a foundational document that Nitza writes. It's the foundational strategic guidance for the U.S. throughout the Cold War. I think one of the reasons why Nitza is not as well known in the 50s and early part of the 60s in terms of his work in NSC 68 is because it's not declassified until the 1970s. And so the sources of Soviet conduct is well known, whereas what we're going to talk about takes a little bit of time to get out into the conversation. We'll finally end up with a little bit of a discussion of the implications of NSC 68. What does this actually do to U.S. foreign policy and to the U.S. military strategy throughout the Cold War? Nitz was born in 1907. His dad is a professor of Romance languages. He's going to spend most of Nitz's childhood teaching at the University of Chicago. So you can imagine the type of household environment that Nitz grows up in. It's comfortable, but it's not incredibly wealthy. He's going to go to Harvard, graduate in 1928, and go to Wall Street. What's interesting is, in a couple of years, he's able to gain financial independence. He sells his interest in a French pharmaceutical company to Revlon, and now, as a young man in his late 20s, early 30s, he's faced with a decision of what do I want to do as opposed to what do I have to do to sustain myself. And so throughout the 30s, he's going to experiment. He's going to try to go back to grad school. That doesn't quite fit. He tries to start his own investment firm. Again, that doesn't quite work out. But he's going to spend most of the decade at Dillon and Reed, which is the investment firm that he started with in the late 1920s. In 1941, as the United States is beginning its mobilization for World War II, 
James Forrestal is going to be called down to D.C. to be a special advisor to President Roosevelt. NHTSA worked under Forrestal at Dillon and Reed, and Forrestal wants NHTSA to come down and help him with economic mobilization. And so NHTSA is going to spend a lot of the war, from 41 to 44, working with Central and South American countries on their economic policies, coordinating the actions of American allies, of U.S. allies in Central and South America to make sure that they're all pulling in the same direction. However, he has a falling out with his boss in the State Department. It's not Jim Forstall, who at this time has gone on to be undersecretary, then secretary of the Navy. So he's just working for somebody else in the State Department, and they don't quite see eye to eye, and NHTSA quits. And his boss tells him, you'll never have another job in another Democratic administration. And NHTSA walks across D.C. to the War Department, and gets a job within two hours as the vice chair of the Strategic Bombing Survey, which is the effort to understand what's the impact of this air campaign in Germany and Japan. So from 44 to 46, that's what NHTSA is doing. It's evidence of his reputation, of his ability to see opportunities, of his hard work, but it's also evidence of the fact that he has principles he's willing to stand up for, even if they're a little bit counterproductive in terms of his immediate opportunities. What NHTSA realizes from his time on the Strategic Bombing Survey is air power is not as powerful as air-minded advocates want it to be, claiming that it's a war-winning capability all on its own. The atomic bomb is dramatic, and it shortens the war, NHTSA believes, by a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months. But in his discussions with Japanese civilian and military officials, he gleans from them that they already knew by the middle of 1945, the war's over. It's just a matter of how it ends. Similarly, air power is not as counterproductive at the strategic level as some of the ground commanders in World War II criticized it as being. It's not, say, ground commanders did one air power. It's that they didn't think that it was necessarily good for air power to be diverted from close air support and long-range artillery to hit rail yards hundreds of miles inside of enemy territory. So what NHTSA comes away from this experience believing is that security in the post-World War II world is going to require both atomic capability and conventional capability, which is going to influence his writing of NAC 68, and we'll see why that's controversial. One of the things Dr. Mills discussed is what's going on with the Soviet Union in the post-war world. After this has service in the Strategic Bombing Survey, this is going to return to the State Department. He is going to work under Kennan in the policy planning staff, and this actually thinks that he's the architect behind the Marshall Plan, which kind of gives you an idea of the competition that these men have. But what he sees is a Soviet regime that's continuing to expand its influence. It's solidifying its control over Eastern Europe, and it's fomenting insurgencies in places like Greece and Turkey, but it's also underwriting a coup in places like Czechoslovakia. And so while Kennan's discussion about the Soviet threat is all well and good, and there's discussion of containment, but it doesn't seem like this is a contained enemy. There has to be something proactive that you can do instead of waiting for these internal contradictions to eventually lead to collapse. Because in all honesty, by the end of the 1940s, this is not a regime that seems like it's on the brink of any type of collapse. In fact, in 49, they're going to have their first successful atomic bomb, and you'll have the fall of the nationalist in China and the consolidation of power in China by the communist. And so at the end of the 1940s, it's hard to see how this containment idea, this patient application of diplomacy, and economic support is really bearing any fruit. As Kennan leaves the State Department, NHTSA is going to take over as the head of the policy planning staff. And the Truman administration wants a revised national security assessment. What should the United States be doing in this era of increased threat? And that's what NSC 68 seeks to do lay out a path for the United States to more proactively face the Soviet Union. Not roll back, not invade, 
but try to put some teeth to this idea of containment. And what NSC 68 builds on are some of the efforts that the Truman administration is already doing in 1949. Dr. Mills talked about the Truman Doctrine, where the United States is going to help with economic aid and military aid any people that are resisting communist incursion. There's also NATO, which is going to begin in April of 1949. It's not the military component that it will come to be, but it's this coalition aspect anchored in Europe to give the United States some foundation for resisting the Soviet Union. Well, the question is, how do you do this, and how do you discern what are these vital areas versus what are not vital areas? Kennan adds a little bit of detail by listing five vital areas. The United States, its industrial capacity is key to maintaining the security, obviously, of the United States, but also its alliances. Britain is similarly important. The Ruhr River Valley in Germany is vital. The Soviet Union has incredible industrial capacity that's only getting better. And then Japan. Well, if you're keeping score, the good guys, the U.S. and its allies, control four out of those five. But NSC 68 takes a different view. NHTSA is going to change this definition of U.S. vital interests. It's no longer going to be geographically based. It's not going to be based on access to natural resources or economic opportunities. It's going to be based on something that the Truman Doctrine references, that Dr. Mills references, and that is confidence, prestige. How can the United States maintain an alliance like NATO if its allies can't trust that it is a worthy and dependable ally? And the awkward part of making prestige a vital national interest is how do you quantify it? How do you know you have enough prestige? How do you know that the investments you're making are increasing your prestige? There's not a good barometer for this. The other aspect that NSC 68 focuses on is the power of American ideals, specifically individual freedom. NHTSA in the document outlines that the U.S. focus and foundation on individual freedom makes it antithetical to the Soviet Union. And so a foundational part of the United States foreign policy needs to be exporting and explaining the benefits of individual freedom. But again, that doesn't necessarily fit in an easily quantifiable policy formation process. How do you know you're exporting? How do you know you're explaining well enough? And what's the best way to do that? Is it informational campaigns? Is it diplomacy? Is it military? And this is probably the more controversial aspect where NHTSA discusses what the United States needs to make these values and prestige credible. You need both an atomic and a conventional capacity. Whereas Kennan's not necessarily focused as much on the hard process of containment, what NSC 68 seeks to do is put some teeth behind it. It's all well and good to send aid to people who are fighting a war, but you need some capability if the Soviets continue to push against what you've told them they can no longer do. And the problem with this is when this document's drafted in early 1950, there's a new Secretary of Defense. James Forrestal is out and Lewis Johnson is in. And Truman has very clear marching orders for Lewis Johnson. And that is you will keep the Defense Department budget below $14 billion, which we all think we can get by on $14 billion but it's a paltry sum when you look at what NHTSA thinks is necessary. Because the atomic capability now has to expand. You need thermonuclear weapons. But on top of this, you need an increasingly large conventional military that can deter the Red Army, which is not demobilized. Lewis Johnson has no interest in cooperating with the State Department. So there are no DOD officials involved in drafting NSC-68. It's a State Department document. And that's okay because NHTSA and Secretary of State Dean Ashton have no intent of putting budgetary figures in the document because that would only dissuade the Truman administration. But even still, when it hits Truman's desk in the spring of 1950, it's a dead letter because it's hard to see how you put something like this in action. And it's also hard to see how you sell this to the American people. How do you expand the Defense Department budget and risk domestic economic collapse? But reality is going to intervene. 
The Korean War forces Truman's hand. When the North Koreans cross the 38th parallel and invade South Korea in the summer of 1950, they put the Truman administration in an awkward position. Months before the North Korean invasion, Dean Acheson at the National Press Club was asked if you could define U.S. vital interest. And he says, sure. Japan is clearly a vital interest. Korea is a peripheral interest. It's not something that's as important as Japan. And there's some criticism afterwards that this gives the North Koreans and by extension the Soviets the green light to launch an invasion. But this is not a fringe opinion. This is the opinion that Eisenhower holds. This is the opinion that the Joint Chiefs of Staff hold. And this is Truman's opinion of Korea. So what's different once there's an actual invasion? It goes back to this idea of prestige. Because the U.S. had guaranteed the Republic of Korea. They had sent military aid. They would sent advisory teams there. It's a U.S. ally. And if the United States is going to willingly allow this ally to fall, then what message does that send to European allies who are much more at risk? So you have to act. And the problem with this action is if you look at this picture, those aren't atomic bombs. Those are conventional tools of war. They're extensions, evolutions of what we used in World War II, but it's not the type of war that some of the air-minded advocates, some of the nuclear-centric folks are arguing is necessary to fight a war after World War II. And that's because what NHTSA wants to offer in NS-68 is a range of military options. You've got to be able to provide something less than atomic annihilation. If what you offer your allies is either peace or atomic destruction, don't be surprised when your allies don't want to sign on to that agreement. So when we look at the Korean War, it's evidence that this prestige argument starts to really influence and impact U.S. decision-making. And that's going to continue. The prestige aspect of the decision to get involved in Vietnam is going to be fundamental to that decision. How can you abandon the Republic of Vietnam to a communist insurgency? What message does that send about the dependableness of the United States in maintaining its coalitions? Another aspect of NSC 68, when we look at the impact of this document, you can see in the immediate post-war budget, there's a precipitous decline. This is in constant 2004 dollars. So that 14 billion is obviously inflated a little bit. Lewis Johnson would not have been happy. But you can see what U.S. defense spending is. And then in 1950, it's going to rocket back up again. And it's never really going to go below $300 billion throughout the rest of the Cold War. And that's because what NSC-68 does is it militarizes this containment policy. It takes what Kennan advocated, but it puts teeth behind it. It puts four deployed units in places like Europe, where we're going to maintain two core until the end of the Cold War. It puts units forward deployed in places like Japan and Korea, where we still have forces today. Now, you see the impact of NSC-68 endures throughout the Cold War. There's going to be variations, there's going to be evolutions on the theme, but nobody's really going to question the fundamental premise that in order to be effective as a deterrent, in order to be reliable as an ally, you have to maintain a large standing conventional military, but you also have to maintain an increasingly deadly atomic arsenal. And this is a radical departure from the United States practice of building up a wartime army and then going back to a small peacetime army. So when we look at NHTSA and his contribution, he's going to continue to serve in government after he leaves the policy planning staff, he's going to continue with the State Department. There are some fallouts when the Eisenhower administration comes in because he served a Democratic administration even though he himself was a Republican. When the Kennedy administration and Johnson administration are in power, NHTSA will rise to be Secretary of the Navy. But in terms of influencing policy, this is probably the high point of NHTSA's 
career when he's writing NSC 68, the foundational document for foreign policy and for national security strategy throughout the Cold War. Thank you. All right. We have questions? Uh, I enjoyed your uh, uh, presentations very much, let me say, uh, to start. Uh, but my question is uh, that all things considered, and given your knowledge of this uh, era, do you think that uh, 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 Kennan and Nitze did a good job of uh, uh, working out the uh, logic of confronting the Soviet Union uh, or not? Mm. So I will do mine, I'll, and then Please. you can yep. fill in. So I think that Kennan's got an effective articulation of the end game. The, yeah, these internal contradictions will eventually bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union. The question is, well, what do you do until that happens? Clearly, you have to have some proactive policy that allows you to show your allies and show the domestic audience that you're doing something as opposed to, you know, trust us, this is okay. And I think together, yeah, they understand how the Soviet Union, where its weaknesses are and how best to press them, but not press them too much so you solidify their resistance. So uh, you, you, guys, you, you have probably figured out that, that Nitsa and Kenna are, are two very opposite thinkers. Uh, Nitsa is more of a doer. He, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's got a plan for how to do things. And, and Kennan is more of a big picture guy, just, um, you know, d d with the idea of containment. And, well, is it everywhere? Well, it's most places. But the, the one thing that I, I think about when I, when I think about your question uh, about the early Cold War period, I think the strength of Nitsa and Kennan was that they took a, a very confused time and, and, the, and they, they put some guidance behind it and they, and they gave the government a direction. Because coming out of World War II, Roosevelt was all about, let's get along with the Soviet Union once the war is, is over. Whatever we need to do, let, let's, we'll, we'll give in to the Soviets on this point, we'll give in to them on Eastern Europe and we'll give in to them be, because we need their cooperation afterwards. Uh, towards the end of his life, in fact, the last month or so of his life, he figures out, you know, the Soviet Union is gonna, going to be tough to deal with. Many in his administration and then the Truman administration that follows quickly figure out that the Soviets are going to be difficult to deal with. But nobody really has a, a direction. Nobody has a, 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 uh, a good idea of, of what that's going to look like. And I think what Nitsa and Kennan do, do is give the government a, a, an azimuth, give, give them a direction to go. Um, and, and many of them already wanted to go down the containment road anyway. And then Nitsa, uh, Nitsa's idea of, look, you've, you've slashed the military too far to the bone. I think that gets a lot of people in the government what they're thinking and then their, their beliefs, but it kind of gets them all on the same path going forward. Would you ag agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah. Uh, you talk about the um, Soviet and European spheres, but no mention has been made of China at the time or even Asian area. Yeah, do you wanna start uh, and I'll finish So I'll, 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 uh, okay. I'll start first. So 1949, or by 1949, remember that the government is, is pouring uh, a whole lot of money and support into China at this point. But um, th this brings up a, a great point about domestic politics that, that is going on at the time. Well, you know, one of the, the reasons that, that Truman uh, begins to reorganize the military and and uh, and and makes the air force its own branch and creates the CIA and and the uh, Department of Defense. Is he's getting a whole lot of pressure from the Republicans for being too soft on communism, and then uh, you know what are we supposed to do with China? Is is really the the question other than send guns and money and support to to Chang, and so. Shortly after, when, when China falls in 1949, 
the uh, domestic politics rears its ugly head again as to, you know, who is responsible for losing China? And the question ought to be, well, what could we have done differently to affect uh, what happened in China? And so uh, I think there was, up until 49, there was this idea that we, we're doing all that we can do uh, short of sending sending combat units, but we're certainly not going to do that at this time because the, we just don't have the military capacity to do that. The other um, aspect please. is we, we understand a world where you've got detente, where the Chinese and the Soviet interests aren't always in alignment, and there's, there's significant friction between those two. That's not the world of the 1940s and 1950s. There's much more a view of monolithic communism, that anything that happens in the socialist world happens because Moscow says it can or directly advises or requires it to happen. And so when you look at the early narratives about the Korean War, one of the big concerns is, well, it's a feint because once we get distracted by what's going on in Korea, they'll invade in Europe. And even when there's a little bit more understanding that, well, no, the Chinese are going to be involved and the North Koreans really kind of do this on their own, there's still an idea that, but the Soviets had to be behind it. And so you don't have that nuance in the policy formation to look at things in Asia or in places like North Korea or when the Viet Minh start to be more of a concern and, and have that nuanced view of, well, they're socialists, but they're Asian, they're nationalists, they have their own agenda. It's much more they're socialists, which means they're communists, which means, which means they take orders from Moscow. And so that's why our policy has to be focused on Moscow specifically. About 20 years ago, there was a lecture here on campus by someone who was covering Reinhold Niebuhr and his role in early political theory arguing that he was the father of some of the international theor theorists and so on. And we know, of course, that Brzezinski assigned him to Carter as a, as a read. Mm -hmm. um, also, we had Kissinger along the way, and we had Brzezinski himself. And two questions. One, was there anybody with, with um, Johnson or with Kennedy who was comparable to Nitza and to, to uh, Kennedy in terms of their influence, or what, were, was, were they relying on these past ideas. Secondly, how did these guys influence each other? I mean, who, who learned from who and kind of bought into their, this stuff? <laughs> this, this is a two-minute question. Okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, so in terms of who's advising uh, Kennedy and Johnson, you've got Kissinger, and I think you know, Kissinger is uh, a little bit, he's writing in terms of nuclear, nuclear arms and foreign policy, and so that's part of it. But you've got um, McNamara, who comes in as a guy who's going to bring efficiency to it. You don't necessarily have somebody as much intellectual in the way that Kennan is. Nitza's not. Nitza, Nitza's more in terms of like a McNamara person, right? So where you've got some folks writing in the, in, in the academy about the impact of nuclear weapons and how that should shape foreign policy, that's in the ether. You've got folks like McNamara who are going to come in, and they're much more efficiency-minded. And so there's not anybody, it's not there's anybody, there's not someone who is as influential in terms of the, the academic intellect that Kennan is in, in the Kennedy and Johnson administration. It's more how do we get the efficiency in the national defense, how do we get efficiency in the, in the Department of Defense. Uh, the second question that you asked was about, I'm sorry, say again? Niebuhr. Niebuhr. Um, yeah, there, there's not, it, in terms of his impact on NHTSA. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so what's interesting about NHTSA is he's not as much of a theorist in terms of the, the intellect in the way that Kennan's much more of an academic. NHTSA is, I want to get it done, I'm a pragmatist. He's going to start... SAIC, which is going to be working in with Johns Hopkins, with Christian Herter, and it's the intent to start kind of a graduate school for State Department employees, but that's about as close as he comes to getting into the theorist world. He's going to write a book on international relations, but it's not necessarily interacting with other intellectual works. It's much more you need to understand what's possible. You need to be 
cognizant of the political constraints, they need to offer advice that's within that context. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that he's necessarily influenced or in conversation with, with Niebuhr. Niebuhr. So, uh, to build off of what you were talking about, uh, McNamara, I, I, I would label McNamara as, as a theorist because, uh, like you were, you were saying, he, he was, his background, he was CEO at Ford. He, he, hadn't, he knew that, uh, that Kennedy wanted him to join the administration, but he thought maybe as Secretary of the Treasury or Commerce or something. Um, but what Kennedy is looking for is, is the best and the brightest, right? The, that, that overused uh, hackneyed phrase. And, uh, but, but, but McNamara comes in, he's like, all right, so how did the Eisenhower administration do things? Well, you know, pretty short, but pretty small budgets, and uh, they're even trying to de deactivate more divisions throughout the 1950s and heavy reliance on nuclear weapons. And McNamara comes in, and, and he fundamentally changes uh, the, the, uh, the, the way that the military and, and the way that the government thinks about uh, um, about conflict, right? So he's uh, so so he's arguing again for a flexible response, whereas the the Eisenhower administration, uh, with such small budgets, pretty focused on nuclear weapons, but uh, b but they bring in um, some folks who who are advocating a much stronger. Uh, conventional force as well as the, the nuclear weapons, and it's it's McNamara that brings us mutually assured destruction up to the up till his his uh, involvement. The idea with nuclear weapons was look, just limit nuclear destruction to military bases, and uh, and that way we'll make war more palatable. And McNamara's like, wait, what are we doing? No, we got to make nuclear war so terrible that nobody would ever contemplate it. So you have to you have to target my cities, and I'll target yours, and. Uh, and that sort of thing. So, not exactly the you know the the stuff of, of peaceful night's sleep, uh, but it's it, it is definitely a a different way of thinking about things and and uh, and nuclear strategy and Cold War strategy. Did that? I don't know. Is that helpful at all? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. N not, not for Nitza. I mean, that, that's not a foundational influence for him. And I don't get the sense that Kennan is influenced in a large degree by that. I don't know that he yeah. was. Yeah. Should we um, study these two gentlemen in terms of what's going on with China today? Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, ironically, I think Kennan's example of trying to understand at a cultural level and a historical level why your opponent acts in the way that they do, I think that is something that transcends. Um, you know, as far as Nitza, his, he's not anti-intellectual, but he's also not as curious about what's driving. It's more, well, here are the actions. Here's what we see. How do we counter? How do we react to that today? How do we get a proactive policy? It's not that that's wrong necessarily, but I do think that Kennan's idea that you have to understand culturally, historically, why these actions that seem confusing actually aren't confusing at all. Whereas in some cases, Nitsa says, I don't care if they're confusing or not. We, we need to act about it. And so I, that's what I would say is, is applicable is if something doesn't make sense to you, it's not because it's irrational, it's probably because you don't understand the rationality behind it. Is that to, uh, great point. To also, to build on what Kennan was saying, so, so he doesn't focus, or he says that he's not focused on military containment, but confronting our adversaries economically, uh, culturally, artistically, uh, every advantage that we have as a nation outside of the military is is uh, an element of national power that we should be applying against against our adversaries. So, yeah. yes. So, to answer your question, yes. Well, and I think one thing <laughs> we that, should, we that both rely on 
is the foundational strength of U.S. values. And sometimes I think that that can get lost in our current conversations or current discussions about what's going on. But if we still believe in our fundamental values that prioritize individual freedom and prioritize individual choice, then that stands us in pretty good stead against competing ideologies that maybe don't prioritize that. And so both Kennan and NHTSA just ask the United States and its citizens, rely on the things you think are important and put those in competition with other sets of ideals or ideologies. And if you're confident and you believe in what you say you believe in, then you should win or at least not be defeated. In the case of China, I believe Chiang Kai-shek fell out of favor with Roosevelt uh, to the point that Roosevelt wanted him eliminated, which never happened. But if we'd have found some way to depose Chiang Kai-shek and get another nationalist leader, would the situation of China been different, or do we really know? So I'm, I'm going to expose my ignorance, and I'll give something, but I think Dr. Babb could probably much, much more effectively answer that question. Uh, it's the benefit the communists have in the post-World War II era is they've got Mao, who's consolidated control over the Communist Party. The problem Chiang Kai-shek has is, yes, we're funneling him all kinds of stuff, but he's got a coalition that has a lot of self-interested and self-driven folks. And so if it's not Chiang Kai-shek, well, it's going to be another corrupt warlord who probably is looking out for their best interests as opposed to trying to build something that would benefit or, being, or appeal to a lot of the Chinese. And so I don't think it's necessarily the case that, well, we'll just kind of keep going down the line of nationalist leaders until we find their George Washington. It's more what are the fundamental differences in the nationalist as an organization as opposed to what the communists have after World War II. I don't know, Dr. Babb, is that, uh, Dr. Mills, you want to? Uh, the, the only thing I would add is, uh, which you've already touched on, is if not Chang, then who? <laughs> then who, right. uh, You know, um, Chang's at least got a following mm -hmm. uh, that, that you, can, you can exploit. But I, I'm going to tag Dr. Babb as well. What do you, th what, what do you think of it? Please. The Chang, microwave. Chang or got to wait for the mic microphone. Same kind of wonderful dictator that doesn't want anybody uh, brought up to take his place. There was a general by the name of Sun Lee Wren um, that had gone to Purdue and the Virginia Military Institute and had a division uh, in 1941-42, and by the end of 49, he's a four-star general. He was despised by Chiang Kai-shek, and he, he you will see pictures of him um, I, I, with... Um, Stillwell, the, the, and uh, he's also visited in Taiwan by MacArthur. Um, so we have somebody in mind, and, and I, I have read in secondary sources that um, Roosevelt would not have been adverse if Stillwell could have found a way to, to get rid of Chiang Kai-shek. But at the end of the day, when it came time, uh, Stillwell was relieved in August of 44. Wedemeyer was put in. Um, so Chiang Kai-shek, like he almost always did, won in the end against other warlords. I hope that helps. For those of you not familiar, Dr. Babb is our Chinese specialist at yep. CGSC, so always nice to have a ringer in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Were either of these men thinking affected by the rise of the intelligence agencies after the war and the CIA coming in, for instance, did uh, Kennan approve of the way the CIA, I think, went into Italy to combat the indigenous Communist Party? I mean, it wasn't war, but it was a kind of a cultural thing, or would they have approved by uh, our helping the British in uh, Iran with Mossadegh, or did, did, did the intelligence aspect uh, affect their thinking? So Kennan helped to create the CIA, uh, he, and then went on to oppose everything that they did <laughs> after that. So uh, he, he was a great proponent of 
of intelligence and, and gathering intelligence and understood the propaganda game and under, understood um, international policy and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But then, but then he objected to the way that, that uh, we carried out some of those ideas like in Iran and, 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 uh, and other places. I'm not, not too familiar with what happened in, in Italy with probably the OSS during the, dur during the war, but um, yeah, he, he opposed just about everything after, um, throughout the, the, particularly the 1950s, uh, 1960s when the CIA seemed to have pre a pretty long leash in what they were <laughs> capable of, of doing. If you look at NSC 68 in terms of this idea of prestige and how you show your reliability as an ally, it's not that covert operations don't have a part in that, it's just that it's really hard to increase your prestige internationally when you have a whole lot of covert operations. So it's not, say, NITS is morally opposed to these things in the way that Kennan may have thought they were too aggressive. It's more that that's not necessarily the foundational aspect of U.S. foreign policy, and so that may be a part of it, but the real important aspect is how are you showing your allies you're reliable? How are you showing your allies that you've got the capability out in the open that they can rely on? Were either of these men affected by the uh, by McCarthy and the uh, anti-communist crusades of the late uh, 40s and early 50s? Well, the State Department, for sure, w was was a target of McCarthy, but but Kennan uh, w was was not. No. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and that's like Dr. Mill said. The State Department had a lot of pressure put on it just because that's supposedly where the communists come from. And there's going to be loyalty programs, there's going to be background checks, but neither, in NHTSA didn't run afoul of that. And that's in some ways because of kind of the company that he kept. He goes to college at Harvard, he then goes to Wall Street, and then he comes in to the State Department, not from questionable backgrounds. You know, I think Kennan's not necessarily at risk, but Kennan is weirdly attracted to Soviet history, is weirdly right. attracted to learning Russia, spends time in the Soviet Union. How can you spend that much time and not be impacted? Right, right but so. it, it reminds me of Nixon, who was <laughs> such a, a cold warrior, but he, he's able to go to China yep. because he's got the anti-communist yeah. credentials. But Both of these men are ardently anti-communist, and they don't have the involvement with socialist groups or communist groups that some of the other folks in the State Department will have had in the 20s and 30s, so they, they don't run afoul of McCarthyism. They're impacted by it in terms of more the fact that when the Eisenhower administration comes in, they served in the Truman administration, they served under Roosevelt, so that's, they're immediately under more skepticism, not just because of McCarthyism, but more because of kind of partisan issues. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, sources of Soviet conduct uh, uh, in uh, 1947 or whenever it was, uh, uh, George Kennan made this amazing uh, prediction that eventually the Soviet Union would collapse of its own weight. And that prediction seemed uh, extremely unlikely uh, when he made it, and through the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then suddenly it happened. So the question is, uh, suddenly the whole thing came true, or seemed to be coming true. And the question is, uh, is that just a coincidence? Was, he, was it just a wild guess? Or was he onto something? Did he understand some underlying dynamic that actually brought about the fall or collapse of the Soviet Union? So um, at the time, it, it was an article of faith with Kennan, and that, that policy of requiring patience and I mean, over the course of decades, that is that is not a virtue that that any administration has. And I mean, think about it. We we think in terms of the midterm elections two years out and presidential elections every four years. The idea that you've got to wait around 
for, for communism to, to, to destroy itself. Uh, not something that anybody gave a whole lot of, of credence to at the time. But I, I think that, you know, like we were saying, that he, Kennan had been deeply immersed in Soviet culture and thinking, and, and he understood the ideology. I mean, he lived in the Soviet Union for, for years. And um, I think he understood it so well that, uh, that he was able to predict that because he understood it in a way that pro very few people probably did. Yeah, I think that what's fascinating is you know, part of the Marxist criticism of capitalism is there are internal contradictions that will bring about the collapse of capitalist countries. And Kennan turns that on his head and says, actually, no, the real internal contradictions are within this police state. And like Dr. Mills said, it's a bunch of self-interested guys who are really using this Marxist ideology as a cover to create a system where they can be in charge and all the spoils go to them. But how do you keep, how do you continue to confuse the Soviet people? Well, you have to keep telling them that there are all these threats and we have to make sacrifices. And so first it's going to be the fascists. And then after the fascists are defeated in World War II, well, no, the real threat is now the capitalists, the imperialists, they're coming in. And then it's going to be continue to be counter-revolutionaries and people are sabotaging work. And there's always another enemy because you always have to have somebody to fear. Because if you don't have somebody to fear, if all of a sudden peace breaks out, well, then you have to answer the question of why isn't the, econ why isn't the economy working? Why aren't you living in this worker's paradise that they've promised you? Why do you have relative deprivation compared to what's going on in the United States? And that raises a whole bunch of awkward questions. And I think what Kennan is able to see is kind of the first order principles and the contradictions that the Soviet system has, which is it may brief well, but once you start to get into the real world application of it, it all of a sudden starts to be pulled back because of selfishness, because of corruption, just because of the flaws in the ideology itself. Now the problem is, how do you brief this and say, well, give it a couple of decades? And like, like you said, it doesn't seem to go well in the 50s. It doesn't seem to go well in the 60s. Even in the middle of the 1980s, people are saying, well, when's the Soviet Union going to fall? Well, it's not going to be soon. It will be at some time, <laughs> but not yet. And yeah. then, man, it just happens. And then you realize, oh, well, the rot had run deep for a long time. So I think that that's more evidence of the insight that he had, but then again, it also shows the difficulty of selling this as a policy prescription. And that's why Nitz is able not necessarily to carry the day is the wrong way to phrase it, but that's why Nitz is able to have that critique, because if your policy is just wait, well, administrations don't like to run on, trust me, wait, we don't need to do anything. At least Nitz provides you something to do in the interim. To, uh, to, to give you an example, uh, I, I think the, the contradictions, the biggest contradictions are between human nature and economics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, the, in 1955, the, the Soviet Union brought 12 agricultural ministers to the United States to figure out what the, the secret of American agricultural production was. Because they've got these collective farms in the Soviet Union with four times as many people on the, on the, uh, uh, the same amount of land, uh, and, and they're not nearly as productive. The Soviets cannot feed their own people with four times the number of people per acre that than the, the United States has. And so they're, they're here to figure out what is the secret? How do we, how do we match what the, the Americans do? And the long story short is farmers have figured out that the harder I work, the more money I make, right? The, the harder I work, the more crop I have at the end of of the growing season and, and then I can sell it. Whereas your collective farms, that is not the incentive that those workers have. And so the, the human nature piece and the economic piece is something that you can really never, uh, you know, bring together or, or, or sort out. It's, it's, it, in the end, it's, it's going to have to be solved, so. I think a lot of times people all through the uh, 70s and 80s had this image of the, you know, Soviet military being a bunch of guys who were about 12 feet tall. <laughs> and really, you got to go beyond that, I think, and start looking at the economic house of cards that they had behind that, uh, which you were alluding to, I think, with your agricultural example. But their economy was a doggone disaster and still is. <laughs>
Just a point of clarification. Did you say that, uh, that Cannon would argue for disarmament and, in fact, a reduction in, for and, and by inference, a, a reduction in, mili in um, nuclear weapons to a substantial degree? Would that have yes. been his position? That's that, that sounds you, you know back to, yeah. It's yeah, a, that sounds like Randall Niebuhr. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm yeah, well, that because that, that seems kind of weird for a guy, so you know, realist. Well, that was part of the debate after World War II is how do you best reconcile the reality of nuclear weapons? Do you get into an arms race? Do you allow the United States to have the only atomic weapons program? And then when the Soviet Union creates theirs, well, now what do you do? And so there's a push, not just by Ken, but there are other folks who are saying, well, no, the UN should take ownership and the UN should be the only one that has these weapons and nobody else should have them. You know, unilateral disarmament for the United States and everybody else, pinky promises not to pursue these weapons. And it sounds good, but that's one of the problems that NHTSA has with it is it only takes somebody to deal with less than perfect integrity and then all of a sudden you find yourself wrong-footed. And so that's another reason why Kennan may have wanted to do that. It may sound good, and it may make sense, but in terms of realistic policy proposals, how do you give away something that gives you an asymmetric advantage? And then once the Soviets get it, how on earth do you give yours up before they give theirs up? And that's, of course, the Soviet position before they have their own atomic, successful atomic weapon, is no, 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 we're, we will continue to pursue, but really it's the United States that needs to give up, and then we'll step back. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> that, that's the, in an ideal world, it makes sense, but then when you actually try to do it in reality, it doesn't work out. I remember when the uh, Soviets came to America to uh, study the agriculture situation, did they ever improve their production very much? No, what, what they were trying to do was turn parts of Russia into the Midwest, where where they could, uh, where they, corn was actually the big thing that they were trying to do. And one of Khrushchev's plat party platform, if you will, was, was trying to, to uh, turn Russia into an enormous corn producing state so that they could have livestock and, and, and that sort of thing. And no, the, the long story sh short is they just simply do not have the weather uh, that, that we do in order to make that a successful gambit. So they, the, the Soviets were importing grain. In fact, one of, the, one of the, the lessons that we're gonna teach those Soviets is we're gonna stop exporting grain to the, uh, to the Russians. Of course, all the, the, the farmers in the Midwest kind of freaked out about that. And uh, that, that was a, a great market for, for all of our, our excess uh, crops. But no, they, they were never able to. Um, and in fact, the Russians are still struggling with how to feed everybody today. They, they had a, um, as recently, they, they passed a law, no, no imports, no, no food uh, imported. And, um, so it, it's not going well still. Uh, during the Second World War, the uh, uh, Soviets produced one of the best tanks, if not the best tank, that was used, the, the T-34. And I've often wondered w whether or not they thought that they could push their conventional forces beyond uh, Germany and uh, take over uh, a greater portion of, of Europe because they had such uh, a large conventional force and these, these effective armored vehicles. Yeah, so in that, there was a comment earlier about Soviet soldiers being 12 foot tall. In a lot of the national intelligence estimates, there's gonna be just hyperbole about they've got hundreds of divisions, they are assumed to be combat effective, but in the late 1940s and 50s, a lot of these standing army divisions are harvesting in the fields. They're agricultural battalions. And so, yes, they may not demobilize in the way that the United States does where you allow folks to leave service, but they're not combat ready in the way that the intelligence estimates argue for them to be combat ready. And even through the early part of the 50s, it's gonna take time 
to rebuild that combat power from the incredible casualties of World War II. So by the time you get to where they've got a little bit more of an effective defense plan or foundation, it's not going to be armored vehicles, although there will be a lot of armored vehicles. It's going to be a bunch of atomic weapons. And so when you look at war plans in the 70s and forward, it's just hundreds or thousands of atomic strikes all throughout Europe, and then they'll just go through an irradiated wasteland. So it's not going to be armored formations. It's going to be just atomic destruction. To your question, though, there was... an ongoing historical dilemma or, or question is, what would have happened had the United States not launched the invasion of D-Day and pushed forces forward through part, mo most of Germany to, to meet the Russians and, and have them stop? What if they had kept going and, and uh, taken over France and, and that? So it's a question that can't really be, be answered, but there was concern that the Russians wouldn't stop. They'd just keep going to the, uh, to the Atlantic coast, and, and then what do you do? Fortunately, we don't have to, have to worry about that. Uh, and to give credit where credit is due, the, the Russians did withdraw from Austria, which was also a four-power occupied uh, country as well, and, and we negotiated with the Soviets to leave, and, and they did. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, just, when, just when you think you got them figured out, <laughs> then they go and do something reasonable. Yeah. You get one in a row. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a streak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, thanks, everybody.